My name's Emmy Barker. Um, I'm a vet. Um, I graduated out of Bristol University a few years ago now. Um, I actually got my fur baby here um, just after I graduated. He was kind of my graduation present to myself. I work as a specialist vet at the University of Bristol's um, feline centre, small animal referral hospital. I just work with cats and dogs, something for which I'm very, very grateful for. I also work within the molecular diagnostics unit at University of Bristol as well. So I suspect that not necessarily knowing my name, quite a few of you will have known the name or listened to um, Dr. Chris Helps talk about genetics, um, at, often at the Supreme Cat Show where he, he does talks as well. He runs the molecular diagnostics unit and actually he was my supervisor when I was doing my PhD, which again kind of was molecular genetics based. What I'm going to talk to you about today is, is an overview. It's not just on amyloidosis, but it does have reflections into that. And, and I'll go through that, uh, the reasons why in a second, because it bears back to why we're doing the genetic screening, what are we looking for? Now, why do we do genetic screening? Not every cat is a designer cat, like Karl Lagerfeld's cat. Um, we also do genetic screening to find out for diseases as well. We want to be able to identify which alleles cause defective proteins to be produced, which can go on to result in disease in our friends. If we are able to identify the gene that's affected, if we are able to identify how that gene has become mutated or damaged, we can then identify those cats that are going to be carriers of a gene, particularly if they're carrying a recessive gene, which you need the two um, copies of it to result in disease. If we know that these are out there, we can gradually remove them from our gene pool. We can stop the disease from being present. The other thing that we can do is that instead of not breeding from any cat that is carrying a defective gene, what we can do is just make sure that none of the kittens that we breed have the ability to express that disease. Okay. So one of the things that we have to be very careful of when we know that there is a genetic mutation out there is not just stopping from breeding any cat that's carrying it because we know that that's very detrimental to the gene pool of our cats. We know that there are some really great lines out there that may be carrying in their background a genetic mutation and it's not that we want to stop breeding from any of those. We have to be very careful where we go but we can modify the risk of us actually having affected kittens. And I'm sure that none of us out there want to have a kitten affected by disease. The other useful thing with genetic screening is that for some diseases, and amyloidosis is one of those, some of our cats don't show any evidence of there being a problem until they're quite late on, maybe after we've started breeding from them. And even though we know in our heart of hearts we would never want to breed from a cat, that is going to pass on a disease to its kittens. If we didn't know that was going to happen beforehand, there is obviously a, a concern about that. Um, so what we want to do is be, to be able to predict those cats that are going to have these problems so that we don't breed from them. Now, there are examples out there where this has happened. So one of them um, is something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, this is where the heart um, wall becomes very, very thickened. And because the heart wall becomes very thickened, it can't pump the blood around the body like we would like it to. Eventually, this results in heart failure. And unfortunately, that can mean that we lose our cats um, before their time. Now, there are many diseases that can result in thickening of the heart wall. So for example, cats that have an overactive thyroid gland cats that have high blood pressure, um, cats that have um, a pituitary tumour, some of those can do it too. But it's also present as a genetic disease. We know that in our Maine Coons and in our Ragdolls, they have mutations within one of the proteins that forms their heart muscle. That means that their heart muscle becomes thicker and thicker over time and they can end up in heart failure. In our Maine Coons, we know it to be what we call autosomal dominance. So they only need one broken gene to potentially have the disease. But we know that not every cat with these broken genes actually goes on to develop it. So we can't screen our cats using um, echocardiography to be able to identify all of them. 
We also know it in our ragdolls as well. And interestingly, it's a different part of the same gene that causes the problem. So we have to do different tests for different cat breeds. Now, in our ragdolls, um, as we can see on this table here, if they are carrying two abnormal genes, we know that their risk of death is significantly increased. But if we actually look at it in this curve here, we know that we lose about half of those affected ragdolls by about six years. Now, most of those ragdolls are potentially going to be bred from in that time. So that's why it's quite important for us to be able to find a way of identifying them sooner rather than later so that we can avoid breeding from them if we can do. And as I said, like with the Maine Coons, we can't identify every cat with ultrasound of their heart. Now, the reason why I use these two as examples is because what we do this genetic test at Langford. There are other centres that do this genetic test. But over the years, we've monitored the number of cats that have samples brought into us that have this mutation. And over the years, this has become, been coming slowly and steadily down. And this is really good news because when it started off, this wasn't mandatory. People had the, made, were able to make that decision themselves to be able to do this. So with responsible breeding and people accepting that there is an issue out there, it is possible to slowly breed it out of the cats that we have. We can now go on to the reason why you guys are all here, to listen about amyloidosis. So amyloidosis is an accumulation of a protein. This is an abnormal protein, it's called amyloid. Now amyloid itself um, isn't any one single protein, there, are, there actually can be many different ones. This abnormal protein can be present either in a single organ, say the liver or the kidneys, or it can be spread throughout the body itself. As those tissues become full of this abnormal protein, they become damaged, they don't function anymore. They become stiffer, they become much more fragile and they have the potential to split and tear. These proteins form structures together and they kind of form plaques around cells as well. And this probably sounds very familiar to a number of you and I'll come on to why that, that in a second. Now, with our cats with systemic amyloidosis, the major protein that's associated with this is something called serum amyloid A. This is a normal protein, typically in normal animals. We do get amyloidosis in cats. The most common example, the most one that's kind of really out there is the renal amyloidosis that we get in our Smileys and in our Abyssinians. We still don't know what is causing it at the moment. We haven't found the genetic defect yet. We also know that one of the reasons why I'm here is that we do get systemic amyloidosis in our Orientals and in our Siamese as well. We can also get it in domestic short hairs. We can get most things in domestic short hairs if you see enough of them. We can get it in our Devon Rexes too. We see it in our diabetic cats. We also see it in cats that have spongy form encephalopathy. So the cat form of mad cow disease. So these are all diseases where we get aggregates of abnormal protein in areas that we really don't want it. Humans can get amyloidosis. So when I was talking about the abnormal plaques forming in tissues, actually the diseases we get in humans are things like Alzheimer's, in Parkinson's, in rheumatoid arthritis. These are all diseases where abnormal protein forms in different areas of the body. It happens in dogs. Very similar to the situation that we have in cats, we can get inflammation, we can get sharp A fever, and this can be where, that again, they get abnormal production of protein and deposition in tissues that results in failure of those organs. We see it on sharp A's and they can end up not only having quite severe life-limiting pain in their joints, but also kidney disease as well. The amyloidosis that we know in our Orientals, we know in our Abyssinians, is caused by deposition of a particular protein, something called serum amyloid A. Serum amyloid A isn't a single protein, it's a whole family of proteins. It's involved in the transport of fat around our bodies, in particular cholesterol. It's in involved in the recruitment of inflammatory cells, and we know that the production of serum amyloid A goes up in inflammatory conditions. It can induce enzymes to be produced as well. 
when we look across the different animals that we have in our animal kingdom, we find versions of Cerebrum amyloidae everywhere in multiple copies. This means that it is very important. It's not a protein that suddenly is produced in disease. This is a protein that is required for life itself. But in some cases, it starts to cause a problem. Most of this protein is produced by the liver. And some of this is produced all the time. And some of this, as I said, is in, has increased production when we get inflammation. And this has a very kind of important role when it comes down to when we see amyloidosis itself in our cats. Now, the systemic amyloidosis that we worry about, um, unfortunately, there's no easy way of diagnosing it. When cats start off having this problem, it can be very, very nonspecific. The cats that we have may be quiet, they may be dull in themselves, they may stop eating, they may start losing weight with it. Um, they can get inflammation in, in areas of their body, which will not be great. Um, they may that way exacerbate the fact that they're not wanting to eat. We can get swelling up of their abdomen. Now, the really unfortunate thing is, is that being a cat vet, I know that the majority of my patients will present lethargic, anorexic, often with a temperature. It doesn't help me if I see a lethargic, anorexic or inappetent cat in terms of working out exactly what's going on on them. Cats are phenomenally good at hiding when they are sick often until they are very, very sick in themselves. When we examine our cats after they've passed away, um, or even if we examine them at the time when we're kind of looking to see what's going on inside, we can usually see that their liver is big because it's full of this abnormal protein. As a result, it's also pale as well. The spleen, which is another organ where this protein can be deposited, is also big, is also pale. And their, in, their, their intestines, which can also be an area where we get this protein being stuck, often looks abnormal too. In our patients, when we do look at them, there are some risk factors that we know of, things like recent kittening, other infectious diseases, things like FIP. And that's where it can be a potential issue because it's not that we're not going to be breeding from our cats. We have to keep breeding from our cats to get the lines that we want. But certainly, it may be that we have a queen that maybe is carrying amyloidosis, kittens, and then suddenly goes downhill. And it can be very difficult to try and work out actually what's going wrong with them. Now, the first thing that we need to do with amyloidosis is actually suspect that it's there. The same thing is true for FIP, which is another area that I look at. The suspicion is based on the history. For example, if we knew that there were family members that have it, the breed, like certainly with an Abyssinia and a Somali, it would be much higher up on our list of suspicion and the clinical signs associated with it. Unfortunately, a lot of our cats present because they've had a, a massive bleed, often from their liver or from their spleen, because it's become so fragile that it bursts itself. The only way that we can diagnose this is going to be by taking biopsies of the tissue that's affected. And again, that's going to be very difficult because our patients are going to be in a, in a not a nice situation. Um, and it is obviously quite an invasive procedure to get that answer. Um, and it's not without costs either. We know that when we do take those biopsies, because these cats already have abnormal tissue, the risk of them having further bleeds when we biopsy them is also increased. And even when, as vets, we do clotting times to make sure that their blood should be able to clot, it doesn't mean that they will clot, that they will close it off. And even though we might put teeny tiny needles into our tissues to try and get samples, and that's good for ruling out other diseases, it doesn't necessarily give us amyloidosis. So what we look for when we look at a tissue sample is all of this pale pink here, that's amyloid. That's amyloid that's taking over the, the organ, and this is the liver. In our Siamese and Orientals, we do see amyloidosis. We don't think it's common, but we don't think it's rare either. Um, in one study, albeit a small study in Europe, about 6% of the cats presented, of the kind of Siamese or Oriental cats presented for examination, had this. We've known that this has been happening since the 90s, 
it is out there. The difficulty is going to be that is the identification, the diagnosis, because we can suspect it in a number of cases, but if we're not prepared to go to the next step of actually confirming it, potentially in our patients that have already passed away, then we're not going to necessarily know. And if those samples aren't taken, they just drop off the radar. They're not reported. In our Siamese, we know that the liver is usually the first place that's affected. We know that when we look at them, all the other places are affected too, but the liver is where we start to see the problems with, from our cat's point of view. We can see it affecting the kidneys as well. It affects our cats in their young to middle age. So again, often around the time that we're starting to breed from them, but potentially after we've already bred from them. And there's no way that we can screen our cats before we've bred from them to identify which ones are going to be at risk or not. There's also no treatment that we can give to our patients either. We can support them through an episode of bleeding. We can try and reduce the stress that they have in their lives and not kidding from them again. But other than that, there is absolutely nothing that we can do to help them. And that is a very difficult thing to say as a vet because I want the best that I can do for my patients. And it's really difficult to have a patient that effectively has a sword hanging over its head waiting for it to bleed. Now, our suspicion is that with our Siamese, as with our Abyssinians, that it is associated with a genetic problem. We just don't know what that genetic problem is yet. We know that it's not linked to them being male or female because it can affect both of them. We also know that it's complex. We know that affected cats can be born to non-affected parents. Now this means that either the gene is what we call a recessive one, so it's kind of hiding in the background and will pop up every now and again, or you might need only one copy of the gene, but it doesn't affect every cat that, that carries it. We know that actually it's a different form of amyloidosis than we see in the Abyssinians, so it would be lovely if it was the same gene, but we don't think that it is. When they've looked at them, there seems to be a different protein when they've compared the Abyssinians to the Siamese. So what are we doing about it? There are groups across Europe, across the States and in the UK that are getting together to be able to get together as a group. One is to put it out there that this is a disease, that this has been around kind of coming up to what 30 odd years, 25, 30 years now. The, we have to confront it. We have to be aware that it's there. We can't put our heads in the sand about it. But we still need to get some more information about it. As much as we can tell you about it, we still don't have a way of easily diagnosing it at the moment. There is a website that can give you some information as to what's going on there. Unfortunately, I'm not too sure what's happening with the website because when I tried to log into it yesterday, I got some beautiful pictures of gliders. So I think something's gone a bit awry with it. Um, but you know, certainly you can usually get some information on there. Now the reason why we'd like to point you in that direction or in the Facebook page is what we are trying to do is to recruit cats. We are trying to recruit cats that are older and completely healthy. We're trying to recruit cats where we know that their brothers or sisters <coughs> or, or offspring had amyloidosis or is suspected of having amyloidosis. More importantly, if we have cases where we suspect they have amyloidosis, where they pass away because of amyloidosis or clinical signs that could fit with that, that we get samples from them as well. Now, the samples can just be mouth swabs and actually I've got a whole box of mouth swabs down there. They're the same ones as we use when we're doing the genetic testing for coat colours. All you have to do is wipe it in the cheek of the mouth of the cheek of the cat. It is also possible to do it on blood samples as well, but that means you have to go to a vet and get a blood sample taken and have their fur clipped. Mouth swabs are usually just fine. And ideally, we'd also have the pedigree as well. So when that we kind of look back at this data, we can compare it all together. And that's not so that we can identify which lines are affected and point in those directions. It's so that we can tie it all together and just try and make sense of it and make it work. 
we have come across genetic diseases and I've worked on genetic diseases where it has been possible to kind of track back through the family tree and work out roughly where the mutation occurred. But it is of no use to anybody to know which lines those are in because we know that going, going down those lines there will be cats in there that are not affected, that are not carriers, that should be bred from. So pointing the direction at particular lines is not helpful and that's not something that we want to do. What we want to do is to try and to be able to identify which individuals are carriers or affected so that we can then do responsible breeding to be able to eliminate this disease from our population. The more samples we can get, the better. Unfortunately, nothing in life is black and white. We know that there will be some cats out there that potentially could have gone on to develop amyloidosis that live into older age. And to counter that, we also need to have cats that, you know, as many of the other normal cats as well. So we are asking yourselves, if you haven't already, to consider submitting swabs. The more samples we get, the better the, the research that we can do. Genetic testing can be very useful. We can do selective breeding and responsible breeding to eliminate diseases from our populations. We can make large differences um, to really reduce the incidence in our cats. But we need to do this, to remove those cats from our population, slowly and carefully. Um, but it's some, certainly something that can be done. I mean, the ragdoll breeders have done it. The, eight, the, the Maine Coon breeders have done it. So I'm fairly sure that us as Siamese and Oriental breeders should be able to do it as well.